John Doran, thanks a million for accepting my invitation to come on to my series, Asking the Hard Questions, What Legacy Are We Leaving Our Young? Now, John is a guidance counselor, writer, public speaker, TED speaker, educationist, well-being enthusiast, based in Newbridge, County Kildare, working from there, but has worked all over the world. So thank you very much for accepting my invitation and for taking the time to join me in this uh, endeavor. What an opportune time to actually discuss this area. I have followed your work. I have a, I'm impressed with your line of thought. And would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your experience to date? Well, thank you, Teresa. And I'm a pleasure to spend this time with you. Yes, I'm an educator now for 27 years, author of Ways to Wellbeing, which is taught now in 140 schools in Ireland. The international edition has gone around the world, just came out a couple of months ago. And I'm a TED speaker and public speaker in schools for trust bodies and also in the corporate space as well. So I, I just have a passion and enthusiasm for helping people show up as the best version of themselves. Excellent. So ways to well-being. What demands have this COVID-19 period placed both on young and old? And how have you, through your work, sought to assist in addressing these demands? I suppose it's brought well-being to the fore in terms of how to keep the well-being table stable. And I, I sometimes kind of, I sometimes kind of kick back against the word well-being because I think it's become something of a cliche, Teresa. You know, people call me guru because they can't spell charlatan. But um, I don't think there's any simple answers. But I think it, it, to answer your question, it's put, the, the pandemic in the last year has put into central focus our own resilience, our own adaptability and our own capacity to deal with adversity. And I think what you will find in terms of teachers and young people and parents, we have adapted remarkably and perhaps given, haven't given ourselves enough credit for how well we have coped with the current piece. I'm thinking of teachers and how they've moved to the online space. People who couldn't turn on a computer in anger are now Zooming and meeting and doing Google Meets all over the place. And young people, again, have a remarkable intuitive capacity for resilience. And I think um, behind every adversity, Teresa, I like to say there's, a, there's, not, there's an equal, if not greater opportunity. And that opportunity to see the benefits, to look for the possibilities and seek solutions and to get young people and all of us in touch with that intuitive resilience. It, it, I think it's been a, a hidden benefit or, or, or bonus sure. in these tough times. So would you believe that a resilience is more cut than tough? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think our intuitive resilience, which, and the word resilience is from the Latin word resilio, which means a spring back. I think that spring is internal, but sometimes we get caught in, the, in, the, in, a, in a negative belief pattern that we actually somehow are deficient in our resilience. So I think it's about reconnecting people to that intuitive resilience, to that self-belief, that capacity that's intuitive. But I think it can be taught strategically, and I think it should be taught strategically. The idea of your values, your strengths, your self-talk, how to manage stress. I think these are essential uh, skills. I sometimes ask the question, are we preparing young people for a life of tests or for the tests of life? And it's not about preparing the path for young people. It's about actually helping prepare young people for the path. And sometimes I think we can take away young people's resilience by trying to smooth the path too much. Now, COVID has righted that a little bit and young people have been tapping into that capacity in ways that I think hopefully surprise themselves as well as other people. I suppose uh, my generation, the generation behind me, uh, were guilty of being of giving too much to their children and in a counterintuitive way, disempowering them, rendering them soft. So it probably is a great time for instilling and growing resilience. What do you think? Definitely. And I think, again, some of the hidden benefits of this period has been young people being able to reconnect with their families, sitting around the kitchen table and speaking, you know, we live in, I call, we call it the tyranny of, bus of, of business. You know, this uh, uh, obsession we have with productivity. You know, and there's a power, there's great power in a pause when you're living your life and fast forward. And we've actually been forced as a society to pause, to reflect what's important. You know, and many people, if you ask them what their key values are, say family, 
and yet we spend most of our time on the N7 or rushing here or rushing there. And now we can actually force to actually take a breath. And a lot of young people have been able to reconnect and families and actually take that moment to say, what is important and what's not important? And they're very important questions. So I suppose really, would you say that it's in Ireland since 2008 in particular, that work was taking over and encroaching on the other uh, domains of life to the impoverishment of home life and building uh, connections in the home and getting to know children and getting to spend time with them and converse with them, et cetera. Instead, both parents, because of the past face of pace of life and because of the demands of life, both parents were out working and the emphasis was on the material. What do you think? Well, we, we, we live in a very frenetic world, you know, as I say, tyranny of busyness. And certainly the world has got faster. You know, the days, the months, the weeks, the years, the past by like cat's eyes and a motorway. And I think that has been to the detriment of family life and also personal life. And that ability just to actually be just to, 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 to stop for a moment and smell the roses. You know, there's a lovely line. What is this world full of care? We have no time to stop and stare. And the last 10 years, we have had very little time to stop and stare. And we've done about 10 years of that in the last year. So are we teaching our young the language of anxiety? What is the cause of the heightened anxiety and mental health issues that are coming to the fore, particularly across the last five to 10 years? Well, I, 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 there's no simplistic answers to that, Teresa. And I'm always, aware, I'm always wary of any simplistic solutions to complex questions. And I think there's a number of factors, but I think you have to to look specifically at the world of technology and how technology has changed the emotional landscape and connectivity of the world. And I think with screens comes stress. And I think um, that has been the single biggest change in the dynamic of relationships in the last 10 years and will be going forward. Are we teaching young people the language of anxiety? That's a very difficult question to answer. Well, I think we need to start thinking of antidotes to that. Yes. You know, uh, and the pandemic of loneliness that has happened and the pandemic of disconnection that an awful lot of people, too, that too many people feel. And I think the antidote to that is actually a connection, is a sense of self-worth and self-efficacy, that physical distance does not need to mean social distance or emotional distance. That We live in a very siloed world in the last 10, 15 years. And I think the present times, give an opportunity or a window to reconnect to what's important and to disconnect from what's not important. And maybe to reimagine a, a language around emotions. A lot of young people particularly don't have a vernacular around emotions. So they, they feel this anxiety, but don't know how to actually manage that anxiety. And I think that's where the conversation has to go to now, to give young people a vernacular and a comfort level around how to manage emotion. Mm -hmm. I came across a beautiful model um, emotional intelligence mapping by Carl Gardner, which he is using uh, extensively across the world. And it, it, it's used at school level, right through into the workplace, right through to top levels in the workplace and used to get the conversation going in times of conflict and in team building, etc. It's a lovely model. I'll introduce you to it. But uh, really, I suppose, on the, the flip side of it, if you look at you and I, we have had, we are working from the backdrop of enjoying, uh, having enjoyed the face-to-face -face on the ground connection and, and building the skills of connecting and uh, reading the body language and communicating and listening effectively and everything. If you take the youngster now who has been hurdled further in to the world of technology because of circumstance with COVID, in the absence of our great backdrop of communication, I wonder what the net outcome will be. Will it be further a uh, disenchantment and uh, alienation? Because really at the end of the day, there is no substitute for the face-to-face -face and the embrace. What do you think? There's certainly a piece around education in terms of technology, and it's, I suppose, how to get the best out of technology and to see it as a tool, uh, but also how to mitigate its more harmful potentials, you know, 
And I think there, that is, and when you mentioned communication, one of the, the difficulties is reading body language when you're texting on a screen. So it disconnects you from a whole important part of communication, which is body language and reading those signals. And it can lead to the keyboard warrior and people saying things that they would never say, in, in the, saying things in the virtual space and would never say face to face. So it, there, there's, a, there's a difficulty there in terms of empathy, in terms of that emotional intelligence piece. And I think certainly there's a necessity um, to teach young people how to use technology in a way that's beneficial to them and actually to mitigate the more harmful potential aspects of it. Maybe the early exposure to technology is most damaging. How would you see the early exposure to technology and dependence on technology as a purveyor of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. How do you see that translating in the child sitting in front of you in the classroom? How is it translating in terms of ability to read, ability to concentrate, ability to synthesize a piece of, of, of writing, ability to communicate their learning to you or represent it it, uh, on an exam paper at the end of the day? Well, I think it's a wider conversation, Teresa, and sometimes we can kind of go down the rabbit hole of just focusing exclusively on its ramifications on young people. But I think the wider conversation is to us all, really. I mean, our, all of our capacity to focus has gone down exponentially. I think it's, what, seven seconds now in terms of attention span? Mm -hmm. So it's had that effect on all of us, whether you're a digital native, like all young people are, or a digital immigrant, like we are, um, I think it's a wider conversation that's to be had between all age groups. I mean, if you go into a restaurant, uh, you will see most people, you know, our, our age group glued to a screen. And we sometimes think it's only young people. It's a, it's a wider conversation for us all. I mean, sitting around the kitchen table, you know, a parent could quite, quite often be saying to the young person, the screen, but they are sitting with the screen themselves. So it's, it's a wider conversation. And many of us older people go to bed with our screens, probably I most of us. I suppose I'm really hitting at it from the point of view of our young in formation. And let's say if, for instance, a, something goes ahead unhindered and on and, and uncorralled uh, for a 10 year period, you end up with a whole generation of youngsters who have been uh, reared in this way and brought up to this way, uh, to this way of being and they miss some of the vital development that we enjoyed at their age. I think I, I saw a, 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 a colleague of mine had an interesting way in terms of the parenting piece that you refer to. Mm -hmm. And he had where the young people didn't have unfettered access to screens, they had to earn their screen time. So if they went out and did their chores or did a bit of exercise, that earned them 15, 20 minutes screen time. And I thought that was a very wise piece of parenting there, rather than, because, you know, in the arms race for your attention, none of these apps, Netflix, Snapchat, Facebook, none of them will say you've had enough. So therefore they're hoovers for a young person's attention. Right. And 20 minutes can turn into four hours to five hours to six to seven hours. So I think actually putting strategic parameters around young people's access to screens, educating them actually, you know what, it's good to get away from the screen. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important in terms of the parenting piece and in terms of a young person's self-management and responsibilities to put boundaries over usage, I think will be very important going forward. So how have modern day approaches to family life and parenting, in your view, contributed to the rise in problems among our young and our young adolescents? I think it's a great question. I think I, 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 if I could marry those two questions together, you know, what do I see as the biggest problem with technology? Well, certainly with social media platforms, it's the ratings game. You know, when you're when a young person is looking at the Kim Kardashians of the world, they're always lesser than. They're never pretty enough, smart enough, tall enough, enough enough. And so they're always playing second rate. And they don't realize that, you know, these pieces by social influencers, maybe 400 pictures were taken, you know, that they're seeing the edited, curated lives of people and they're comparing that to their unedited lives and they never match up. And I think parents have been seduced into that as well. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And I call it, but you know, I, I can remind people that you're a good enough parent. You're a good enough partner. And I think a lot of people are coming at it from a deficit model. And I think parents, particularly during the pandemic, need to say, you know what, I'm doing as well as I can. And to actually, rather than look at what they're not doing and say, golly, I'm not as good as a parent on the road, is actually say, you know what, you're doing very well to stay in the surfboard, to start from a strength space 
I think is really important. Too many people, Teresa, are giving themselves a very, very hard time. And the flogging doesn't, you know, it's a bit like the, the flogging will continue until the morale improves uh, paradigm. I think you have to start from, you know what, I'm doing as best I can and to build from that rather than actually lamenting how bad I am as a parent or as a per person or as a partner. And I think uh, social media seduces it into thinking nothing we do is enough. And I think too many, par too many parents are very hard on themselves. And I think maybe stop the flogging and give yourself some credit would be a good starting premise. Okay. And um, you know the old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. What hand is rocking the cradle in present day modern society? Well, I, I think the hand that rocks the cradle, I think you, we mentioned it before, family, parents, you know, parenting has been, never been more important. And I think I'd like to make the distinction between being a parent and being a, and being a friend. You know, so, so a lot of parents fall into the trap of trying to be their young, young person's best friend. Actually, being a parent sometimes is going to be difficult and demarcating those lines is not going to be uh, re received thanks. But I think the hand that rocks the cradle is, is and should be uh, is the parent. And, and that parenting piece, that family piece has never been more important. To make sure the technology is not rocking that cradle, that the parents take back that power from the screen and realise that they can is a really important part. I ask it in light of a, the pressures on young couples where both have to go out to work, etc. So looking at it from that perspective, what hand, what drivers are presently rocking the cradle? What influences are forming that child from a six month old a, right through to entry into school? If it's not the home, well, I think it's a number. It's you know, obviously the media. You've got technology feeds into that. The school and of course the peers. But the most, I suppose, the most important uh, element is the person themselves and their own conditioning. And I, I, I often say that the most important words that you will ever hear in your life are the words that you say to yourself and believe. And, and too many young people that I come across have a crisis in confidence. A, a lot of young people are suffering from a low self-esteem. They don't see where their place is, why is and their that? space is in the world. Why is that? Partly because of what we mentioned, this, uh, this continual world of comparison that we're living in 24 hours a day. The ratings game that we're all playing, not just young people, we're all playing this ratings game. You know, the, 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 what I think with Gore Vidal said, the worst thing that can happen to me is my my partner succeeds and my neighbor succeeds in life. So we're playing this rating game all the time and we never feel we're enough. Sure. And, and I, I think it's, it's, it's really important that we don't put conditions on a young person's concept of enoughness. And that I often say that no amount of points in the leaving certificate will make you more enough than you already are. No name played on the office door. So no that, affirmation from friends. That's so you are, you're, you're already enough. And I think we need as, as educators, as, 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 as teachers, as parents, is to remind young people of their own innate self-worth. Mm -hmm. It takes me nicely to the question, is our education system in its present format fit for purpose in light of the fast-paced world these youngsters are going into and in light of a post-COVID technologically enveloped world that they're entering? Well, I think the, the education system as it's presently constructed is perfectly designed for a world that no longer exists. Now, how, how quickly we can break, bring in, how, how quickly we can actually close that lag is a moot point because the forces of the bureaucracy work, move very slowly. But I think we, we really need to, you know, young people are talking now not for a job for life like I had, but a job for the life of the contract, you know, give them a mobile phone and a passport and they're good to go anywhere in the world. So to answer that question, I think, are we preparing them for a life of tests or tests of life? We're coming to a crossroads now where there's a critical mass of people, parents, educators, technologists, we realise that there's a lag and we need to address that lag and make it more fit for purpose and teach the skills for the 21st century. But those with the power to address it, A, can they see it? And B, will they expedite measures to do it? Because I see. If we, I, I, I see. If we don't move, we're lost. 
I see positive science, Teresa. I, I see positive science between all the stakeholders, being in the Department of Education, be it the teachers on the ground, and, and also the partners in business and elsewhere, and parents that see the, the rising level of anxiety and stress, etc. I think there's a growing consensus that change has to occur, and that change and the flight path of that change has to happen quicker than perhaps we would have liked it to happen. happen. But I think there's a critical mass of people that, that realise and sense the urgency to make sure that, because to, for, let's be very frank, school fails too many young people. And I would ask the question, if you leave a school and you don't know a sense, you don't have a sense of self-worth, what your strengths and values are, can you really say you've had a good education? And too many young people leave school not knowing uh, uh, their strengths, not knowing their values and not having a sense of self-worth. And I think we really need to change that. We need to change that sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, the Irish always prided themselves in having the best education system in the world. How would you rank it now? I think we have some of the most, the most fantastic educators and I've been privileged to meet many of them. I think we need to help and, and actually input into their well-being as well, may I say, which is really important, you know. Teaching is hard work because it's hard work. And I think it, it takes enormous reservoirs of energy. And I think we need to really invest in our educators conscientiously and, and unapologetically, I would say. I think it's up there, but I had a, a very interesting conversation with an educator in Finland yesterday, a very renowned educator, who says that their uh, reputation as the leading educators in the world is, is, not, uh, is very uh, myopic. So, I, I, again, I don't want to play the ratings game on that question, Teresa. It's very easy to give a simplistic trite answer. I sure. think um, all it, there's no there, there's no perfect education system out there. Yeah. Whoever yeah. I see, it's about making it fit for purpose for the Irish context and yeah. where it comes internationally. Well, that's uh, well. Unfortunately, I think the PISA and the OECD, etc., have, have have invested in that game of 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 comparison and ranking which probably is retrograde in ways. We've got to um, play to the cultural differences as well. And on a more micro level, play to individual differences and applauding individual differences, would you not think? I would definitely say, again, I, you know, one size does not fit all. And I think you're right, the cultural context uh, is specific to the Irish circumstance. But I think we hold our own, certainly, in terms of what we're doing. But I think we'll be judged by our capacity to change and pivot to meet the, the changing and evolving needs of young people, not as they were, but as they are now and as they will be in the future. That's the litmus test for our education system and our stakeholders going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I were to ask you to cast your mind forward to 10 years, 20 years, what would you like to envisage as school and as education? I think the PISA report in 2021, the PISA uh, are looking now at creativity in terms of thought. I think creating young people who have a creativity and an independence of thought, have a belief in themselves and, a, and their capacities to be, you know, to be and do whatever they want to do, to be possibility thinkers. I call myself a possibilitarian. We need a generation of possibilitarians, of young people who are what I call water thinkers rather than rock thinkers, who are fluid, flexible, agile, participate in the gig economy and have that sense of self-efficacy I think that sense of self-belief and self-worth and from that reservoir and spring a uh, lots of different things can come from so it's about skill acquisition rather than incubators of just pure knowledge and content it's what they actually can do with that content um, and that agility that I think would be the litmus test going forward so I'd like to see a more flexible approach to content and to mm -hmm. skills and, and being able to be critical rather than passive consumers of content more critical and adroit in actually looking at content and facts and information where it came from and how it can be fit for how it can actually be used I, I think that's where we need to pivot to in a more strategic way so let's for one moment cast our minds forward pitch the human beside the robot beside AI how do you think the human will fare? What is it the human has that will help him or her retain supremacy over technology? I think it, the answer to that lies in our first 60 seconds, connection. 
I mean, I think in 15 years' time, 10 years' time, there's a very good chance if you're on an airplane, there won't be a pilot, but there will be an air steward or air stewardess saying, are you okay there? We're only going through a bit of turbulence. Are you fine? Put on your safety belt. You know, AI will be able to replace a lot of things and a lot of things will be mechanized and automated in the next five years, let alone 10. Mm -hmm. But it still hasn't caught up with our capacity to be able to connect with human beings. So our, our ability to connect, to listen, to empathize, all of these are critical the soft skills. So the higher a young person goes in whatever uh, 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 you know, uh, career sphere, the more important those soft skills go. I would say that those soft skills, that word soft skill is misnomer. Those soft skills are the critical skills for the 21st century. It's about the power and capacity of young people to connect, to listen, to, and I think AI can't replace those. That's the, they are the secret sauce going forward. And these are the skills that we should be levering leveraging towards and leaning into our human skills so what would you say to the business owner who's decrying the fact that the youngsters coming into his workplace now uh, are lacking in the soft skills and uh, really that the education system as they see it has failed them while it may be a far greater impact from other forces as well but what would you say to that business owner what would you see as his or her best avenue or approach to ameliorating that type of deficit? Well, it's a really good question because a lot of the language of business is kind of seeped into the school planning language. We're talking about total quality management. We're talking about KPIs, et cetera. But I think there's a conversation that needs to be had between business owners and HR people particularly and schools in terms of these skills. I mean, collaboration, working as part of a team, you know, project-based management, you know, project work, teamwork, you know, listening skills, communication, both written and oral and oral. I think it's really important that schools and educators and principals and, and, and the stakeholders listen to these, you know, that the, the, these are the skills going forward. But I would also put a caveat there. I mean, we, we shouldn't be just pitching schools to the needs purely and exclusively of business. It's also about what kind of person that we want. So I would ask, oh, say, one of the, oh, yeah. I think the, the key question for young people when they say, sir, I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I think a, a more pertinent question is who do you want to become? Who do you want to be is a more important question. So the business aspect and career aspect is only one part of the jigsaw puzzle, but it's a, it's, a, it's a key one. But I think more to the point is what kind of person do we want to shape? And I think it's about character-based education. What kind of character, what kind of values, what kind of strengths do we want to inculcate and bring forward from our young people. And what's the best ways to do that? What's, the, what's out there at the moment in terms of education that we can use and adapt and pivot to that can actually bring forth that kind of uh, uh, quality of education and outcomes that we want for our young people? So it's really, you, you, we're appealing to the whole. The, the, the whole, the holistic education. It's well, not just get preparing the, the, the youngster for the workplace. It's preparing them emotionally, physically, uh, uh, spiritually as well. Well, Theresa, you know, we, most mission statements in schools in Ireland have some uh, reference to holistic education, but sometimes I think we, make, we pay lip service to that. What does that actually look like in a, in a very secularised world? How do we actually let young people know that that sense of purpose, that sense of spirituality, that sense of emotional development, physical development, are all essential for their ongoing development. It's about that character. And what does that look like in the 21st century? Because what got us to here is not going to get us to the next 10 years. So I'm talking about imagine, imagineering, really, reimagining education and having a conversation about what that might look like. And central to that conversation is the student voice. Ask the students, don't dismiss the importance of a young person. The most important people is the people in front of you. They need to be central to that conversation. And sometimes I think that young people's voice gets pushed to the side and we, the older people, will tell you what you want. Ask young people, what do they want? What are the skills that they would like to see? And they will tell you. And I think they have said they have a rich vein of data that sometimes we neglect in having that conversation. They need to be central to this conversation. I suppose, really, as an educator at heart, in our education system, in its present format, really, it needs to be looked at, you would agree. And we need to, let's say, make it more, render it more fit for purpose. Yeah? So, I would, yeah. Uh, how, in your view, 
educators viewed by society, how educators viewed by society in general at this uh, point in time? In your well, experience I, I, and in your observation through the media in particular? Well, I think uh, there's been a renewed and enhanced appreciation of educators in the last year from parents who now realise that teachers are severely underpaid uh, and perhaps undervalued when they've had to be homeschooling all of this time. I think uh, traditionally and historically in Ireland there's been a, an appreciation of the role that educators play. And, and I've had the privilege to work with partners, both primary and post-primary, and their dedication is second to none in the main. Um, but I think there's a piece around valuing them even more. I think uh, the attrition rates, the uh, intensity of pace of education at the minute, the stress levels are at unacceptable rates amongst colleagues, both at secondary and primary level. And I think we really need to, as a matter of urgency, invest strategically in the capacity of, of teachers in terms of their energy and renewal, uh, in terms of their own well-being. They certainly are crying out for a moment to slow down and to invest in their capacity because there's been initiative overload, Theresa, in the last five years, the amount of initiatives that have been coming along, the amount of changes, and I think it's an, av an avalanche. I was speaking to a colleague recently and I asked him, how are you? And the person said, I'm overwhelmingly overwhelmed. And I think an awful lot of people in education feel that way, Theresa. I think we all need to gather our breath and uh, we need strategically to invest in our educators as a matter of, our, of great urgency. Yeah, I always, I've always argued that a nation that does not invest in its educators and respect its educators has a big price to pay down the line. And there are times I'm fearful here in Ireland. Well, not understanding what has been done by educators in pivoting and in doing what they have done, but maybe there's a need for harmonization across the board to fully uh, represent what it is that educators do. And to, you know, you, you spoke of speaking to the Finns, uh, to somebody high up in the Finnish education system recently. And I quote Pazzi Salberg in, in his rendition of how the Finns actually recovered from a recession. And they spoke up their educators. They said, you are our entrepreneurs. Without you, we cannot recover from recession. Every teacher was sent back free on the state to do a master's and only moving forward only the best the best brains were allowed into teacher training and there's a big lesson to be learned from what the Finns did and I think it's wonderful it cost them nothing to speak up their teachers and to to uh, actually verbalize and articulate the respect for them and their indispensability you know what do you think well I think you know you, you teachers could be forgiven for thinking that if society gets an itch, schools are expected to scratch it. And, and schools are in locus parentis, they're not the parents. And I think there's been a, maybe a little bit of a pass the book by society for education and educators to solve all society's ills. They can't. And they certainly haven't been given the added bandwidth or capacity to deal with all the issues that have been kind of left at school stores to fix. So to that extent, I think it's been slightly unfair and an and, and educator who now is master of curriculum content, also a part-time psychotherapist that is looking after so many different capacities. And no one is strategically added to their reservoir of well-being. It's just been taking, taking, taking without giving, giving, giving. And I think at some stage, people or teachers are saying, no mask, no more. I'm at my wit's end. I can't give any more than I have. And I think uh, most teachers that I've come across are caregivers by disposition. And they're your, your natural uh, tendencies to keep on giving until you can't give anymore. And I think we need to reimagine that as well and, and, and teachers need to step back and say, you know what, I can't be all things to all people, nor is it healthy for me personally or most importantly for the teach for young people within my care. So we need to really look at that again, reimagine that and actually look at the workload being put on principals, deputies, teachers, SNAs. And I think um, we, you know, it's it's... It's something that what I would see as a particular matter of concern. You can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And would you think uh, that maybe society at large are too given to looking at the hours and the holidays? Well, I think, uh, you know, again, there probably would be after this, one of the benefits, advantages, you know, I'm a possibility Teresa, is that there will be that renewed appreciation for the state that you just can't keep going, going, going. 
those moments to rest and to recuperate sure. are essential. They're not the kind of a bonus. They're actually absolutely necessity a necessity to keep. You know, it just it, it's very greedy work. It takes so much energy with twenty five wow. people in front of you. Uh, I think those, if anything, you know, they should be sacrificed. That moment, those windows to actually downtime, that downtime, that downtime. That, that strategic reinvestment in yourself has never been more important. That's not going to be diminished as time goes on. So it's, it's really, you know, any system you work for, a system is parasitic. It'll keep taking. So it's, it's incumbent on, on, on leaders uh, of schools to draw the line and to uh, know when enough is enough and to take it, take it in their stride. You know, I mean, the, the, the longer the day stretches out across uh, uh, fulfilling the demands of the workplace, the less likely the other pillars of our lives are going to be serviced. Yeah, and, and, and your productivity. I think you know, there are a lot of research I'm reading at the minute that, you know, that productivity goes down the more you're on without the officer. So I think actually what I would say to all colleagues is uh, unapologetically press the off switch. You know, press the off switch on work, press the off switch on your screens and actually get out into nature, reboot, refresh. And uh, nearly everything works if, you're, if, you t if you turn it off for a while. But say that to the principal who on a Saturday morning receives a circular from the Department of Education and he, he or she now knows that he's going to have no Easter holidays. Because yeah, I, I, it's been spoken for by the system. Yeah, and I, I, it's it's very true. I spoke to this very recently, and I think the the burden on 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 managers in schools has become intolerable, and will have the negative consequences of good quality talent not wanting to go down that path, which is to the detriment of all partners in education. Mm -hmm. I think principals have to make that strategic choice not to read that circle on a Friday evening, not to read that circle on a Saturday morning, and to turn back on their screens on Monday. And not to apologise to anybody for doing so. It but is a choice. They, they, the message is the same Monday morning. You're having no Easter holidays because we have now bagged them for your duties with orals and with uh, our new reconfiguration of exams, etc. You know, I, 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 I take that point, Teresa, but that shouldn't allow you to sacrifice all day Saturday and all day Sunday as well mm -hmm. as as that inevitability. I so, think you start. You need to start reclaiming your time and actually doing that unapologetically but you're, you're you're right it's it's a it's a real concern and i know some of the stakeholders in the napd are looking at that and and i think it wow. needs to be uh, a, it's certainly a conversation that's top of the agenda so i suppose i've come to a point in this conversation asking you are we leaving the next generation our young with a whole lot of challenges and fewer opportunities than you or i enjoyed I would like to think no to the second part of that question. I, and to the first part of your question, um, there will always be challenges, not least the challenge of change. I'm co quietly confident that we will give our young people no challenge that they're not equal to and, 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 and better than. Um, and I think the biggest legacy that we can give young people is a belief in their own capacity to, to meet and to excel any challenge that comes their way. I think that's the ultimate legacy. And I think the great privilege for any educators is the privilege we have to leave our legacy in the hearts and minds of young people. And what I see of young people on it every single day, I'm confident, quietly confident in their tenacity, ability, kindness, and confidence that they will be more than able to meet the challenges that we leave them. We've given them a difficult, a difficult challenge, but I have every faith and confidence in their capacity to meet them. It comes to mind just now, will they be in a position to meet them if their power and their civil liberties to act to meet them is curtailed? I would never write off young people. I think people have been writing off young people since the days of Socrates. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking about their power and their civil liberties handed down within the framework of governance, etc. I think it's too soon to, 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 to answer that definitively. I would say no. I don't think any I don't think any boundaries on young people will curtail them. That would be my own, and perhaps I'm guilty of being the possibilitarian. But I would say, no, I don't think anything will limit young people. I am very enthused and confident in what I see, that passion. I think we, we're quite often too hard on young people. But I think when I see 
you know, young people, I think their sense of social justice, I think their set their their the renewed care they have for the environment. They I am very confident that the next generation will be more than able to match any curtailments, any impingements. Um I think they are, you know, to use that cliche, but I think it's really after this circumstance, they are the future and they will they will meet the challenges and excel. Excellent. So what words of advice and encouragement would you give to Generation Z as they launch on out into life? Six words. Uh, believe in yourself. You are enough. And I think belief in yourself is the most important thing you can have. Uh, and uh, it costs nothing. So I would say believe in yourself and you are enough. If you actually internalize those, it untaps unlocks, unleashes and unloads a creative reservoir of energy that would help you surmount, surpass and get over or get under or get around any challenge that may be in your way. It starts off with belief and that you are enough and there's nothing outside of yourself will make you more enough than you already are. So we're living in a, in a time of promise and optimism. 100%. It's the only way to look at the world. You know, what you say you are Will quickly will quickly find you. So if you have a, a an optimistic expansionary style, if you're looking to the horizon to the possibilities, uh, and that unlocks a power and capacity in you that's very different to looking and say, "Oh God, the world is gone, our freedoms are curtailed, the world is going to hell in a high cart." There's no percentage gain in having that yeah. mentality, in my opinion. You have to have a mindset that looks to the horizon that has a possibility focus, that looks for the benefits and solutions. And if you and that's tapping into a young person's natural buoyancy and optimism. Yes. And we can't afford to rob them of that. I think it's very important that we actually bolster that rather than take away from that natural yes. uh, disposition of young people, that natural buoyancy that they come to the table with, which is one of the great gifts of youth. And I think we have to do everything we can as people, as partners, as as parents, as educators, they augment that boss to that. Well, maybe, maybe the systems and not least the education system may, might be, it might stand accused of uh, maybe robbing that spontaneity in ways as it presently is, you know? Do you think you are enough? Be who you are? Might I'm very, apply, I, also, I, I, might yeah. apply also to our teachers and our of the, 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 the society in, in general? I think we're very hard on ourselves as a profession, as educators, Teresa, and I think we need to reassure ourselves that we're doing everything we can with the ability we have in the time that we've got in the space that we're in. We're doing the best we can, and I think we need to give ourselves more credit. And actually, we're, I think, you know, to, to, we're very hard on ourselves as a profession. As, as human beings, we're very hard on ourselves. So I think we need to give ourselves credit and uh, to look in the mirror and to be on, to make the conscious decision to be on good terms with yourself, as I think is, is a really important investment, Thank not just for yourself, but for the people that you are in your orbit. Right. Is there anything else you would like to say before we, we, we end this conversation? Is there any question I forgot to ask you? I think it's been a very comprehensive uh, conversation. I've enjoyed it thoroughly, Teresa, and it only remains for me to say, stay safe, stay well, and also from to you and through you to whoever looks at this podcast, I hope that the next years are full of positivity and promise for yourself, for your children, for our educators and for everyone. Excellent. Lovely. And again, John, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.